Welcome to our lecture today on ocean giants. Uh, this follows on from our lecture last week uh, entitled Shark's Tales where we were looking at uh, one of the largest um, items of megafauna in the ocean and how fascinated we might be in those wonderful powerful uh, fishes. But today we're going to look at the other giants of the ocean, the great beasts of the sea, uh, which have long inspired wonder and fear in many uh, and I'm sure inspire a lot of wonder and perhaps fear in you all as well. Um, but more recently these ocean giants, as we call them, um, have become symbolic of the state of our seas. Um, fortunately for species like the green sea turtle, which you see in that image there, some of them are amb ambassadors for conservation and change and the money that these species bring into conservation is of epic proportion. However, our fascination in these wonderful, iconic um, ambassador species it doesn't always lead to their protection uh, and can quite often lead to uh, human impacts upon them uh, which aren't favourable and leads to many of them being very vulnerable uh, in our um, climate-threatened world. We've for long tried to chart the ocean and map um, its confines, its geography, its topography, but we've also tried to map um, the beasts of the sea as well. This is the Carta Marina, um, a medieval map uh, of the marine environment in which we see some of our mo more iconic um, ocean giants, the baleen whale there and the orca, uh, the killer whale, depicted uh, in this kind of bestiary-like way um, as these beasts of the, the ocean, the sort of kraken sea monster uh, kind of characters. So at this time uh, our ocean giants were, were seen as being a threat, a threat to us uh, and something to be feared and potentially to be conquered. But we've now come to realise, hopefully not too late, that the great beasts of the sea aren't just these embellishments, they aren't these iconic caricatures really. Um, they're essential to the rhythms of sea life and the functioning of the marine ecosystem. We mentioned a couple of weeks back um, the Stella's sea cow, which has now become a, really an icon for our persecution of um, giants of the sea. This is a, a relative of dugongs and manatees. It's a Cyrenian uh, from the genus Cyrenia, uh, unknown to science until 1741 when it was first described by German naturalist George Stella, who accompanied um, uh, an ex, uh, sorry, an expedition to the Bering Sea, uh, a voyage of discovery into the North Pacific. Um, but our fascination with this wonderful, gentle, docile uh, marine mammal uh, ended in its unfortunate demise only 30 years after it had been discovered. It was exterminated by 1768. Um, and this extinction of this beautiful, wonderful animal, which, you know, in modern times we would spend uh, long periods of time in contemplation of and fascination of, um, is it's a dramatic example of how vulnerable, isolated, small populations of marine megafauna can be. And we find ourselves in this predicament uh, in the current times where very small remnants of populations of some of these gigantic, wonderful species um, are confined and isolated to ocean areas. Uh, and that you know, has advantages for their protection, but it also is extremely challenging in that we're maintaining what can be quite relatively small populations of species. And animals were persecuted not just for hunting uh, and for general sport. Uh, the sea cow that you, sh you saw there was hunted uh, for sport and just for, for general conquer uh, of the, the marine world. However, it was extremely useful uh, on those expeditions in cold waters um, where the blubber, um, the fat, the meat of those animals could provide uh, extensive food resources uh, to people, uh, you know, on in remote places on expeditions, voyages of discovery around the world's oceans. But other species have been used for food uh, for for many um, centuries as well. Uh, one of the great foods of the 18th century, indeed centuries before, uh, and at least one century afterwards, was turtle. Uh, turtles. Um, in our culture, we would see is um, far from being a food source, but cultures around the world have eaten 
turtle, um, whether that's in turtle soup or turtle meat, um, as well as using a lot of the body parts of that animal um, for various other uses. Um, but the slow moving nature of turtles meant they were plentiful um, and easy to catch uh, and p extremely um, useful, particularly on long voyages um, uh, at sea. Uh, they were very useful um, for sailors in particular. Um, and it's uh, throughout Australia, throughout America, um, throughout um, South America, um, lots of cultures have relied on turtle as an important food uh, on, on expeditions and on shipping missions. But other cultures have also hunted turtle um, for extremely long periods of time. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, in Melanesian societies, uh, in Papua New Guinea, for example, um, turtle was a common uh, meal at funeral ceremonies. Um, so these these animals are still harvested and hunted for food in lots of parts of the world, sometimes illegally, sometimes legally. Um, but the cultural significance of these animals in terms of diet, as well as um, their uses in um, you know, um, currency, but also as artifacts and curios. Uh, the value of these items, of these species, is extremely high. And that makes cultural conservation, conservation which is um, related to, you know, cultural values, extremely challenging. And in lots of parts of the world, education is being used to kind of overcome some of these cultural barriers that exist to harvesting what are now extremely vulnerable species uh, in our conservation uh, status that we use. But why else are the ocean giants so fascinating? Um, one of the main reasons is the huge um, geography that they're able to encompass. Um, most of these giants of the oceans are world travellers. Um, this is the Atlantic uh, bluefin tuna uh, we see here uh, depicted. A huge um, migration uh, take, taken on by this species it overwinters in Japan, migrating to California, uh, and over the course of that journey, um, these fish support huge global fisheries, uh, yeah, fisheries all around the world. So protecting these migratory species is very important for our own use, uh, but let alone um, the volume of ocean that these um, ocean giants encompass over their life histories. Um, and their, their interlinks over those um, huge ranging uh, global food chains within the ocean. So the distance, the epic distances that these um, fish, marine mammals um, can travel in their lifetimes uh, is something that makes their conservation very challenging, uh, protecting these dynamic species, but also it adds to their wonder and their fascination how these fish, for example, in this picture can travel uh, so far uh, and why they do. Uh, and our understanding of that is, is rather limited. Um, obviously it's for breeding and feeding purposes, but the, the, the sheer scale of, of these migrations uh, is epic and still fascinates us today. The grey whale, another species um, renowned for its um, extremely long migrations. Um, this species of whale, uh, called the grey whale because of its patterning that you can see on its back, its grey and white patterning. Uh, this was hunted to near extinction in the 1930s, um, but uh, a real conservation success story, the grey whales, uh, their populations are extremely um, abundant uh, in recent years, or much more abundant obviously than they were uh, in the 1900s. Um, but grey whales migrate from breeding lagoons in the north and south of America to summer feeding grounds in the Bering Sea. So another species um, which migrates great distances. Um, however, looking at the scale of that animal in comparison to that survey vessel there, we can, we can well imagine the need to migrate long distances of that animal compared to that bluefin tuna which we saw in the previous shot. And the scale of these ocean giants is arguably the, the number one thing that fascinates us. Um, this is the ultimate marine inhabitant, the largest animal ever to have lived, um, the blue whale. Uh, great um, Latin name, great scientific name there, Balaenoptera musculus, uh, sort of depicting its vast proportions in its muscular body. Um, these um, species are particularly fascinating for their scale uh, uh, because of, you know, um, just their comparison to our terrestrial animals and how, how much bigger they are. 
Um, but obviously in that three-dimensional um, marine world uh, of salty water with a higher density uh, than fresh water, we can see uh, what supports these amazing animals uh, in the water. Um, but that body, that, that huge uh, muscular body, as you can see depicted there, uh, is important ecologically as well. Uh, there's a terminology called whale fall, which is basically the, the fall of these giant um, beasts to the ocean floor uh, when they've passed away. The carcasses of whales on the seafloor are ecosystems in themselves. Uh, the amount of food and resources that that one animal can provide um, to a huge uh, dynamic marine food web is pretty uh, awe-inspiring. One of the most iconic um, ocean giants that we're lucky enough to see here in the UK waters uh, is the leatherback turtle. Um, this is a picture of a leatherback um, which was beached uh, in, off the coast of Somerset in the 1980s and this is the Somerset um, reptile uh, group who were so fascinated uh, and you know, adoring of this animal uh, which you know, had passed away unfortunately but um, showed them a window on, on a marine world. Uh, and was a real real celebration in that region in the 80s. Um, there are seven species of turtles in existence um, and the leatherback is one of them, it's the largest. Um, reports of leatherbacks in the British Isles are numerous. Um, they are migratory species um, and they migrate to near our shores um, for feeding purposes, um, returning to warmer waters along the Atlantic coasts of Central America in the autumn. Um, so this species is largely considered native to our waters. Uh, it's an extremely uh, interesting looking animal. You can see there it's, it's a warty um, uh, covering uh, and it's quite often adorned by barnacles and other um, crustaceans. Um, it's, it's a beautiful and iconic animal which we're lucky to, to have uh, uh, and has been seen off our shores off the coast of Cornwall uh, over the last few years as well. So marine mammals, um, the, the sort of group uh, of marine mammals within the ocean, there's 5,000 known species. Um, only 125 are truly marine, uh, because let's remember that lots of marine mam mammals are able to actually walk onto land, like this sea lion, uh, Galapagos sea lion depicted in this image. Uh, and some are even more land dwellers than they are marine, like the polar bear, that's included in this category of marine mammals. Um, whales and dolphins, cetaceans, uh, are all included in this group as well. Um, but they have a, a huge array of um, adaptations uh, to um, existence in the marine environment um, uh, and adaptations that are very different to our terrestrial mammals. Uh, a lack of hair, uh, although you know sea lions do have hair uh, as depicted in this image, um, uh, they have different mammary glands, different um, reproductive glands and then their terrestrial counterparts. Um, but probably the biggest adaptation to marine existence that these mammals have is their ability to regulate their temperature uh, in the ocean environment. Uh, most of them having large reserves of blubber or insulation of some form um, and able to adapt their um, respiration and breathing uh, to, to slow down um, their bodily functions. Uh, when, for example, they dive to great depths. But also their behaviour is extremely unique. Um, this is the Weddell seal uh, depicted here in a bait bowl of fish. Um, highly evolved sensory systems are what um, fascinates us about our, our marine mammals. Uh, echolocation, for example, um, that whales and dolphins can use to communicate with each other. The dive reflex uh, which is an internal kind of um, feedback loop essentially where um, seals, other diving species can lower their heart rate uh, and divert their bodily fluids to their core, uh, enabling them to dive to great depths, uh, something that we as humans and free divers try to emulate, to try and replicate. Um, so the stories, the ecological stories of these species are particularly fascinating and, and something that um, fascinates us not only as marine scientists uh, and ecologists but also as photographers trying to capture the stories um, of the um, 
activities and the behaviours of these animals underwater. This is the humpback whale depicted in this image. Um, one of the baleen whales, the Mr. Uh, uh, the, the sort of um, scientific term for that, um, in contrast to the Odontocete, which is the tooth whales. So baleen whales with these huge rafts of baleen plates uh, in their mouths that you can see there. They're the filters of the ocean, uh, filtering gallons of water on a daily basis. And this behaviour is extremely important, obviously, for them as a feeding behaviour, but it's extremely important ecologically as well uh, for um, disturbing the water column. Uh, the average humpback eats two to three kilograms of plankton and fish every day that it filters um, out of its ocean environment. And, you know, it's not just the tiny things, it's not just the, the, the invertebrates that are the filters of the ocean, it's also the giants of the ocean that perform this behaviour as well. Um, so we have these, these filter feeding giants, but we also have the tooth giants and the tooth whales are an order of cetaceans that includes dolphins, porpoises um, and all the other whales possessing teeth such as beak whales, sperm whales um, and killer whales. Other behaviours, ecological behaviours that um, fascinate us with regard to the ocean giants other journeys they take. Uh, we talked about them being world travellers and the migratory distances that those species um, uh, cover in their lifetimes is pretty epic. However, there are other journeys. Um, uh, the sea turtles are a migratory species and all the species of sea turtles migrate uh, pretty much no sooner than they've broken out of their eggs on their um, laying beaches. They bark on this kind of frenzied race towards the sea. Um, and then they will return to those same beaches um, using their sensory systems and the imprinting uh, of their local beach, their birthplace, uh, into, their, into their brains, into their memories. Uh, and they follow various um, sort of way markers on that journey to re return to those specific beaches. We believe they follow um, the stars, they use celestial navigation, we believe they follow um, volcanic um, sea mounts and things, for example, on the seafloor, they follow currents. Uh, so these journeys are extremely uh, involved and, and our understanding of them is not, is not complete. But that journey from the marine environment onto land is a pretty epic journey for, for a marine species to take on. It's obviously highly dangerous, it's highly challenging um, and it's highly sensitive. Um, <coughs> Leatherbacks are the widest ranging marine turtle species. They're known to migrate across entire ocean basins. Um, female leatherbacks lay their eggs on tropical nesting beaches but then migrate to foraging areas to feed on jellyfish. One leatherback in a recent study uh, was recording, recorded as journeying across the Pacific from west to east and back again. Um, it was a UK survey that, that, that um, reported that. It was reported in the UK press as well. Um, so some pretty epic um, migrations of, um, across the globe. However, there are other journeys um, with regard to sea turtles that are particularly fascinating. In that image there you can see a representation of the DL vertical migration or diurnal vertical migration of plankton. Uh, we talked about that when we looked at plankton earlier in, in the module, but uh, plankton, a lot of um, gelatinous um, translucent species will migrate down to uh, the depths during the day uh, to not be seen by predatory species of fish uh, and migrating to the to the surface to the to the the, the what is the photic zone at night uh, to not be illuminated uh, and species of turtle will be uh, adapted to um, respond to that DL vernal, uh, vertical migration and modify their behaviours to optimise the exploitation of their vertically migrating prey, such as the plankton in this image. So, you know, an extremely evolved predator in that sense that it has adapted its behaviour um, and its migrations in response to the migrations of other species. So how do we know what we know about turtles? Um, turtles are uh, sea turtles in this case are, I think, my uh, favourite ocean giant. Um, their gentle nature and the, you know, the encounters I've had with these animals in the water are pretty special. Uh, I was lucky enough though to travel to the Bahamas with the Exeter um, Ecology and Conservation Department on their marine biology field trip and 
experience for myself some of the capture techniques um, for sea turtles. Um, we can obviously track turtles by attaching cameras to them uh, and that's how we've built up a, a quite a big picture and understanding of their migrations but there are other techniques that we use uh, to scientifically study these these animals which is extremely important when we try and protect them um, but capturing turtles capturing any ocean giant is obviously um, not without its challenges um, but turtles given that they are relatively slow moving although they can swim pretty fast um, particularly the juveniles um, the capture techniques are um, you know quite successful um, it's much easier to catch young turtles uh, you can see those girls in the image uh, are um, walking a net through the water that's the same net kind of weighted and floated net weighted on the bottom and floats on the surface and you walk that through the shallows usually in areas where they're kind of seagrass beds uh, or something similar uh, and you effectively walk around uh, juvenile sea turtles that you can uh, fortunately spot in that clear water there uh, encircle them and bring them onto shore uh, you then turn the turtle tonic, you turn it upside down, uh, it goes kind of to sleep uh, and then you can perform the, the survey techniques that you need. Um, so those guys in the picture are um, recording um, the weight, uh, the size of the animal, but also looking at the algae that's coating its shell, uh, cleaning it where possible, tagging it, um, taking a tiny, tiny sample of, of the f um, flipper um, just to, to do some, some lab-based tests on that animal. Um, so that's the, the young turtles, the adult turtles, um, the best way to, to catch an adult turtle, uh, and it's quite com comical when you actually have a go at it, is, but is to jump on it from a boat, it's called turtle rodeo, um, uh, and jumping on the back of a turtle and essentially wrestling it uh, uh, onto the boat or onto the shore. Um, uh, it's, it's not the, the most humane um, technique perhaps but it's it's our best technique if we want to really um, protect turtles um, uh, deal with any uh, issues or ill health that they might have but also understand uh, their journeys as well communication is extremely important um, in cetaceans uh, to support those journeys, those migrations, um, but also um, for breeding uh, and other social behaviours that we know those animals um, undertake. They create sounds, um, but they also make physical contact and use body language uh, to communicate. They use clicks uh, to, to sense their surroundings through echolocation, while they use whistles to communicate with other members of the species. Um, so in the image there are short beak common dolphins. These are dolphins uh, that we find off the coast of Falmouth, Delphinius delphis. Um, were in the press very recently, well quite recently in, in 2008, uh, when there was the UK's largest mass stranding event, um, MSE mass stranding event of short beak common dolphins uh, in Falmouth Bay in Cornwall. Uh, you may have seen it in the press, at least 26 dolphins died, which is extremely uh, upsetting. Um, still not completely sure uh, what the, the reason for that mass stranding is, but the communication between those animals means that, that they, can, um, they can communicate for, for advantageous reasons, but they can also c communicate uh, in terms of their demise, uh, in that they, they, they swim together, they travel together, and they aggregate together. Um, in the absence of any sort of other identifiable factors, it was thought that... Um, the, the cause of this mass stranding event in Falmouth was uh, naval exercises, acoustic exercises underwater, which may have confused those animals. But other theories have been postulated. You might have heard that you know, there was a rumour it was a dolphin suicide. Um, however, it's unlikely. Um, there was no disease. There was no um, embolism. There was no boat strike evidence. Um, no real evidence of predatory attack. Um, no unusual foraging uh, ashore no algal blooms, no abnormal weather, so um, it was put down to, um, uh, put down to um, naval exercise in that area. So these animals are known to cooperate as well uh, for their um, hunting strategies. Um, this is the famous um, bubble net feeding strategy of the humpback whale, which produces these epic spiralling images. Um, and this is a, a, a sort of unique behaviour really to these animals. Um, a group of animals swim beneath a shoal of fish, possibly anchovy or mackerel, and make plumes from their blowholes to create a wall forcing the fish to the surface. Um, 
this is a pack hunting uh, behaviour, um, which is is sort of unsurpassed really across the marine environment. But we know these um, whales and dolphins uh, cooperate; other species cooperate in uh, terms of hunting. Pack hunting is also quite proliferant in orcas, for example. But the societies of these animals are something that we really don't uh, understand. And this is uh, an award-winning image by Tony Wu of sperm whales aggregating uh, at depth, rubbing themselves against each other to remove parasites and to remove dead skin. Um, an example here of a photographer who's managed to capture that behaviour and really um, reveal new meaning for us. This isn't science that's revealed this, this is, this is photography. So this is pretty inspiring to us as photographers. But, but why these animals do this, how often... Uh, how significant that is to 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 their to their life history is, is not really known. So just moving on to some other sort of more human uh, consequences of our fascination with ocean giants and our our wish to be cl close to them, our our sort of um, existence alongside them. Um, we talked earlier in the, the lecture about uh, persecution of these animals for hunting. But hunting isn't just a historic practice, uh, it still goes on. Whilst there's an International Whaling Commission, which now has banned uh, whaling across the globe other than scientific whaling uh, in a couple of parts of the world, uh, we still do hunt animals, we still do hunt marine mammals. Um, seal culling is a practice that still exists in Scotland, for example, um, with regard to Scottish salmon farms, many salmon farms have licences to cull seals. This is something that's extremely controversial uh, and something definitely worth reading up about um, in the literature. Um, a lot of people do see, still see these animals as a pest. We have a huge proportion of um, grey seals in Europe um, in, on British shores, um, but grey seals are doing pretty well uh, in that region and have become a pest in certain places. They are perceived as a pest particularly in association with inshore fisheries uh, in Scotland. Um, but this is a human problem. Um, it's a human um, condition. Uh, we've been unable to reverse the decline in fish populations and fish abundance, uh, causing these animals to, to, to migrate towards um, uh, aggregations of fish that are put there um, by humans. Um, so whilst culling might be in a practice to effectively manage this, this industry, uh, it still um, generates a lot of um, outcry uh, in the public. Um, but there are alternatives um, coming about uh, into use, more non-lethal solutions, acu acoustic deterrent devices, for example, um, are now being widely used on lots of Scottish salmon farming netting sites. Uh, but unfortunately, bullets are always cheaper and easier than these non-lethal alternatives. Um, but this is an image taken by Sea Shepherd, quite powerful kind of campaign image. Uh, and the pressure that that organisation is putting on a lot of um, Scottish salmon farms, um, which uh, sea seals as pests, and the pressure there and the monitoring uh, patrols that they have put into the, into the area uh, are having a big impact. Um, so this is sort of ongoing debate. Um, one of my third year students last year wrote her dissertation on this subject. So it's, it's quite a powerful subject, both visually, emotively uh, and ethically. Another kind of emotive uh, subject with regard to marine mammals uh, that's gone global, gone viral. Um, it's a historic practice that's been um, performed uh, in the Faroe Islands for for centuries. Um, the yearly uh, grinder app, as it's called, or the grind, uh, it sees um, ferians um, hunting long-finned pilot whales in this case, um, as well as other species of cetaceans and dolphins. Um, so these species aren't on the IUCN uh, Conservation for Nature um, endangered list, the pilot whales, um, but we don't really have enough data to to, to prove that uh, and, and to prove that these um, populations aren't depleting. Um, but as I said, Faroe Islands have, have fished these seas for centuries and this, this historic practice, why, why, while we might see it as being particularly distasteful, um, dramatic, um, has gone, gone on as far back as 1584. Whaling is deeply embedded in the tradition uh, of the Faroe, Faroe 
um, and it's essential to their survival. These are remote communities uh, reliant on meat and blubber from the ocean. Um, but uh, in more contemporary times, um, the contemporary issue here is that there's a lot of contamination of this meat from um, water pollutants, for example, heavy metals and mercury, which is having uh, a real health implication in, in the population on the Faroe Islands. Uh, so it's it's largely thought that this practice will will eventually disappear, um, particularly with the the kind of social media pressure on it as as a as a as a cultural practice. Um, but another kind of ethically and morally challenging um, historic issue with regard to um, our reliance on these animals uh, for various reasons. Another sort of ethical issue in the conservation of our ocean giants is the placing of these animals in captivity. Much of our understanding of cetacean behaviour uh, and hence conservation uh, of cetaceans of whales and dolphins comes from the obs observations we make of these species in captivity. Um, but that doesn't come without controversy. Um, you've probably heard uh, and watched the film um, about Tilikum, the famous um, orca, which died in captivity in 2017. This individual was brought from Iceland as a calf in 1983, uh, originally to Sealand in British Columbia and then on to SeaWorld. In Orlando where he remained until his um, his demise. Um, this animal was responsible for more than one death uh, of, of trainers uh, and members of the public, most infamous, infamously his trainer Dawn Brancho in 2010. Um, but as the documentary Blackfish uh, inspires us, um, it's an extremely <laughs> controversial um, issue to keep animals like the orca in captivity for entertainment purposes. Um, one of the third years, a couple of years back, I uh, made her final year film on this subject, Empty the Tanks being her mantra for this film, and she went undercover at SeaWorld speaking to some of the trainers uh, and also um, at other uh, marine parks in other parts of the world, in Tenerife, um, for example. So it's, a, it's an emotive issue for, for many of you, uh, I'm sure. Um, but wh why, why do we have these animals in captivity? Well, we do have them in captivity for conservation reasons. However, uh, it is uh, largely for entertainment purposes, particularly when you look at organisations like SeaWorld. Um, however, it's our fascination for these uh, iconic species. You know, uh, the orca is a classic uh, ambassador species for conservation. It's black and white. It reproduces very well uh, on branding. Um, it's a very aesthetic species. It's it's a charismatic species, uh, and our flagships um, are typically those kinds of animals. But we need conservation flagships. We need animals that uh, afford um, respect, but also fascination, and bring in money for conservation. These iconic animals like to look and, um, have a place in um, bringing in revenue for conservation. Um, Green sea turtles, uh, the revenue that comes from green sea turtles, um, from um, experiencing these animals in the wild and in captive environments, funds a huge raft of um, turtle conservation, but also the conservation of other species and supports a lot of local economies around the world. Uh, so another kind of debate point with regard to um, the sort of iconic nature of our ancient giants. Um, we want to engage with these animals in captivity. Most people's experiencing of these ocean giants will only take place in that environment. And that has a really powerful educational, but also um, emotional impact on particularly a young audience. So I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but it's something that we will hopefully discuss uh, in conservation uh, next year when we move on to that module. But definitely recommend you watch the documentary Blackfish uh, about um, Tilikum and SeaWorld if you've not already seen it. But seeing these animals, uh, as I said, more than likely happens in captive environments, but also it happens when those animals might end up in our world. Uh, and Strandings, whether that's mass strandings or individual strandings, um, are becoming more common around the coasts of the, the world, 
and in the UK in particular. Um, around 600 cetaceans became beached in the UK uh, last year, and, and in fact, uh, it's a kind of a annual kind of general figure there. Um, most of them are porpoises and dolphins, the kind of smaller species of cetacean. Uh, but in 2014, for example, about 60 whales um, were stranded uh, in the UK, including longfin pilot whales, minke whales, one humpback, one orca, and one beluga. Um, these are two sperm whales off the east coast of England in, uh, stranded in 2016. Um, whales can become beached um, for various reasons. Um, most uh, unfortunately pass away due to the, the weight of that body uh, pressing down without the, the supportive effect of water uh, on, their, on, their, on their bodies. Um, but we can learn a lot from these animals uh, that end up in our world. Um, <clears throat> causes of these strandings aren't clear. Um, whales sometimes become stranded after being hit by ships or entangled in fishing lines or fishing nets. Pollution, marine noise, as we saw uh, earlier with regard to the mass stranding of dolphins in Falmouth. But these images are pretty, particularly um, disturbing. Um, but we can learn a lot from these animals from their um, uh, entry into our world. The other impact of, um, another human impact of these, um, human impact of these species um, is uh, plastic. We've learned a lot about plastic uh, and its impact uh, on marine species. Um, and I don't want to go into that now, um, but what I will say, uh, uh, an issue that we could talk about here is um, some recent um, statistics produced by Exeter University is that um, obviously we know about accumulation of plastic up the marine food chain so these species at the top of the food chain are bioaccumulating plastic within their stomachs, uh, within their systems, within their tissues. Um, but some research coming out of Exeter says that some of these more common plastics that are um, accumulating in the marine food chain uh, are transient. Whilst they might be ubiquitous, whilst they might be um, throughout the marine environment and throughout the, uh, the stomachs of our ocean giants, a lot of them are uh, recorded as to being passing through to be, to be, to be transient. Um, this research um, by Duncan et al. Um, from Exeter only a couple of years back uh, looked for synthetic particles um, in um, turtles, 102 sea turtles in the Atlantic, Pacific and Mediterranean. Um, and there was a variety of plastic discovered in the, the stomachs of these turtles, including to uh, clothing, tyres, um, cigarettes, uh, fishing, fishing gear. But the majority of, of plastic particles, in this case, were microfibers. Uh, and these um, fibres were found to actually exit these animals. So the small size meant that they can pass through the gut without causing any blockage. So there are, whilst there might be lots of um, depressing uh, and negative statistics out there, um, there are stories, small stories of hope, uh, and some really exciting research. And uh, this is coming out of um, Exeter, just just here in the in the Penryn campus. Um, if you get a chance, you should definitely watch um, a TED talk by Brendan Godley, who's the kind of world turtle expert based at Exeter, uh, and his TED talk is called "United by Oceans," um, and he talks about um, these um, species of marine reptiles, which um, given their, their huge migrations and their journey across our oceans, they unite us uh, globally uh, in marine conservation. Uh, but I'll leave, leave it to him to, to really sum that up for you. Um, but we're seeing some interesting um, patterns, I guess, of change uh, in sea turtles, which are emblematic, really, of the wider threats to the marine environment. Um, one of the interesting turtle-specific um, differences we're seeing in recent years is a feminization of the population of many sea turtles. Um, at present, about 50%, so about half of hatching green sea turtles in this case, um, are female. But it's predicted that up to 93% of green turtles, uh, ha turtle hatchlings could be female by 2100. And this is a kind of climate change implication, uh, where the, the warmer the sea temperature, the warmer the beach temperature, um, the more likely that, that that offspring is to be to be female. Uh, it kind of incubates the egg differently. 
Um, so some quite startling and worrying um, predicaments, although there is advantage in nature to have more females in a population, but 93% uh, is quite a worrying statistic. Um, there are other uh, climate change related implications on turtle populations, um, other than this feminization of the population. It's also um, rising sea levels, um, causing beach retreats so that the nesting area for these animals, when they venture onto the, into the terrestrial environment, that, that habitat area is much decreased. It's called beach retreat. Um, so, um, as I said before, it's looking like our turtle populations are going to be quite stable until 2100, and that's the kind of the, the sort of warning and um, warning kind of um, decade uh, that we're we're looking at as marine scientists um, to to really um, minimise our anthropogenic impact on the environment um, before that date and and make some significant changes to how we manage. Um, those environments and also those species in a more kind of ecosystem way. Just wanted to dwell a little bit more on, on turtles. Uh, I did say that they're one of my favourite ocean giants and I know uh, one of yours as well. Um, so turtles are protected globally speaking. Uh, their nesting sites are protected in, in, most, in most countries of the world. Um, but in certain parts of, in sort of corners of the world, uh, we still do harvest um, turtles for food. Um, since 1996, it's been illegal to remove turtle eggs from beaches in Costa Rica. Um, however, uh, in a certain um, certain part of Costa Rica, um, on the Osa Peninsula, um, sea turtle egg collection is permitted certain seasonal moments in their, their, their breeding cycles. These are olive ridley sea turtles in this instance. Um, but they perform in this location uh, a really sort of um, strange natural phenomena where masses of olive ridley turtles simultaneously swim out and lay millions of eggs on this particular beach in Costa Rica. Uh, no one knows exactly why they all come to the same spot and they call it the Aribada. Um, and this Arabada, um, during this kind of this moment, this this breeding moment, this seasonal moment, locals are temporarily allowed to remove eggs in a so-called sustainable way to avoid overcrowding and improve breeding success. But lots of critics argue that um, this is not great for a vulnerable uh, IUCN species on the red data list. Um, so another kind of contentious debate around turtles. There are organisations that are campaigning against this. Um, uh, but it, this practice still continues, uh, and there are documentaries on this um, on this subject. Um, if you look at kind of Costa Rica conservation more generally speaking, Costa Rica is one of the world's most sustainable nations for various reasons. But this practice um, is not seen by as sustainable by many. But the bigger kind of issue here globally for for sea turtles is poaching, because uh, it's criminal to collect turtle eggs. In, in the majority of the world, uh, poaching does still occur. Uh, these these eggs can bring in a lot of money for a community in terms of uh, a food product, um, but also uh, for egg collection uh, in, for other reasons. Uh, there are lots of organisations doing in research into the solutions for this. Um, there's a company called Paso Pacifico, which are putting GPS trackers in eggs um, sort of to, to monitor and to track um, the, the distances and the, the routes that these um, poachers are taking with their eggs. Uh, there's also other sort of more um, original techniques such as 3D printing of fake eggs and uh, being supplemented into various um, various um, collections. So yeah, another interesting kind of contemporary issue uh, with regard to the conservation of these uh, ocean giants. But on a more positive note, um, in lots of parts of the world, in the more sort of Western world, for Amer uh, in America, for example, in Florida, uh, lots of people are pioneering ways to protect um, the nesting sites of these fascinating marine uh, reptiles. Uh, turtle safe lighting uh, and this kind of more infrared lighting used on beaches, uh, walkways and, and, and huge swathes of coastal areas um, to protect uh, these 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 delicate creatures and enable them to perform their breeding rituals uh, sort of unseen. Um, kept in the dock um, for their benefit and, and not ours. Something definitely worth looking into uh, yourself. But ultimately we want to encounter these animals, we want to spend time with them, experience them and 
you know, foster a greater respect for them. Uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, wildlife, uh, marine wildlife ecotourism is a hugely expanding um, global industry, particularly in close coastal communities where uh, those communities might be displaced. They might be, re be needing alternative uh, employment. So fisheries, inshore fisheries, for example, that have collapsed, uh, you know, uh, whaling, uh, sort of uh, more extractive uh, industries uh, in the marine environment that have ceased. Uh, wildlife, uh, marine ecotourism in this case, uh, is a, a really important alternative for those communities. This is Crystal River in Florida, uh, which is the manatee capital of the world. Um, it's this kind of freshwater spring fed winter refuge um, for manatees. Um, but as you see in that image, uh, these are species which are very gentle and docile, and kind of um, surrounded by these kayakers wanting to, to encounter them and spend time with them in the wild. But, but is this wild? Is this um, the wild behaviours of species that we're witnessing here? Or is this something very different? Um, but, as I said, in coastal communities, marine tourism can form the single most important activity uh, in economic terms, but maybe in ecological terms as well. These encounters are important, as I said before, to try and um, form some understanding and appreciation of these ocean giants. But, you know, wildlife tourism, marine tourism of the whole range of ocean giants takes place in lots of parts of the world. It's not just manatees, it's turtles as well, uh, it's whales and dolphins. Uh, we have a huge number of local businesses in Cornwall, for example, that are dependent on uh, wildlife watching. Um, well, dolphin, seal watching, uh, tours, shark tours. Um, I was lucky enough to visit the Azores recently, which um, is, its, it's, econo its economy sorry, is um, dependent now on wildlife watching of whales and dolphins. It's a, it's a sperm whale um, aggregation site. Um, these whales were persecuted uh, in the past, so whaling in the Azores was, was a prolific practice until quite recently, but the former whaling outposts are now uh, used as wildlife watching outposts. Um, and there's a whole range of providers that occur uh, in the Azores, um, some more sustainable than others. I took part in uh, the most sustainable um, company, uh, well, largely believed to be, called Futurismo, uh, and did some, some uh, whale and dolphin watching myself, uh, which was an amazing experience. Uh, however, we are um, habituating ourselves on these animals and that's going to have some implications. So what's um, turned from a sort of persecution of these species for, for the resource that they provide, um, we now kind of persecute these species uh, in our uh, encounters with them, our, our fascination with them uh, and wish to spend time in their world. So um, definitely something that's worth investigating yourself. Um, but unfortunately there are providers in other parts of the world doing this in a less sustainable way. This is the Cayman turtle farm depicted in the background there. Um, it's a, it's a um, wildlife uh, experience, it's an education centre, it's a conservation organisation if you look it up online. However, this company also sells turtle meat um, and you know makes big business out of that. So there's a whole range of different ecotourist providers and whilst that industry is strictly managed and there are global um, codes of conduct uh, that organisations need to adhere to, uh, the sort of spectrum of providers from the good to the bad and to the very ugly um, is, is really um, a predicament we need to be mindful of. But I'm sure you all uh, aspire to have these experiences with um, ocean giants at some point in your life, I know many of you have done already. Uh, and those moments uh, are probably what have brought you here uh, and will keep you here and will keep you being wildlife photographers or marine photographers in the future. So we all understand the value of these experiences, but we need to really uh, think about how we regulate this industry uh, and how we uh, engage with them in their world, but on their terms. So that's the end of my lecture. Um, lots of interesting sources uh, for you to follow up um, in your own time. I definitely recommend you reading the book uh, by Callum Roberts, a uh, famous professor of marine uh, biology from the University of York, uh, kind of advocate for marine conservation, but his book The Ocean of Life is pretty epic if you want to look at um, 
uh, general marine conservation issues, but he, he talks a lot about the giants of the ocean in that book. The papers I mentioned, um, some of the papers coming out of Exeter and others uh, are listed there. Definitely go and watch Blackfish. Definitely watch Godley's, Brandon Godley's um, Turtles TED Talk if you can as well. Um, thanks very much for listening. Sorry I couldn't be with you there in person, um, but hopefully you found this enjoyable. Any questions, please drop me an email. Uh, I might be able to set up a chat via Microsoft Teams, um, but because this is uh, coming to you live on Monday, um, it might be that you're not set up with that. So just drop me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, once you've looked through the lecture. So thanks, guys. See you soon.